All right. Well, uh, this session is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people uh, to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Today, I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the program manager here. Uh, this course, as all of our courses, are approved for multiple continuing education units, um, as well as our certified green home professional in the energy pathway and AIA health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, and if you haven't yet, um, get subscribed as a member. You can support our events, get instant access to all of our webinars, free discounts on green building certifications and trainings, as well as all sorts of other industry benefits and access that you might not have had. And we've got a couple of these mugs left here, uh, corn-based, USA-made, uh, given to us, sponsored by our board member, uh, Bill, with True Tech Tools. So he's going to send some your way. We've got just a couple left, so make sure to sign up. And before we get started, a huge thanks to our top-tier sponsor, April Air. Help your clients stay healthy. We're talking humidity control, temperature control, air purity, uh, Water efficient humidification is a win for health and water uh, conservation in the winter. And as we know right now, something that's all on our minds, we need energy efficient dehumidification to pair with something like a right sized heat pump, which can keep the air feeling uh, cool and allow you to do higher set points um, while still staying uh, uh, dry. MERV 13 filtration captures particulates of growing concerns such as airborne viruses, PM 2.5, from wildfire smoke, VOCs, dust, and more. So check out April Air um, over at uh, aprilair.com. And thanks to our second tier sponsor, Entertech, uh, as well as um, their uh, other uh, companies, GeoComfort and Hydron uh, Module. They are uh, bringing you geothermal ground source heat pump energy, the most energy efficient uh, heating and cooling system on the planet, right below your feet, very comfortable, all sorts of different system types, um, including uh, ducted, radiant systems, water heating, you name it. And the tax credit is still available for geothermal systems. So they've got systems for commercial, single family, uh, and you name it. So make sure to check them out um, over at entertech.com. All right. So before I hand it to our speaker today, just wanted to get a kind of sense for you know, uh, what the background is of the audience here as far as geothermal knowledge. And so there's a couple polls, just real quick. Uh, so the first one is, how often do you use geothermal in your projects? Looks like we've got someone else who wants to be a YouTube star. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and end that poll. Um, so thanks for everyone taking that. Looks like we got a good portion of folks here who are not using uh, geothermal energy, 77% that is. So uh, great for, for, for taking that. And then uh, the next one is, you know, whether you use it or not, how familiar are you or familiar are you that how, how much do you believe you are familiar with this product and technology? All right, it looks like we've got a pretty good uh, scattered mix uh, here, but at least from what in a majority of you probably a little less familiar. And so you're here to learn. And so, you know, you're, you're definitely in the right place. Um, so with that, I wanna turn it over to our speaker today, uh, Scott Musgrave. We're gonna be talking about funding ground source heat pumps through new utility like models. So Scott, welcome so much and please take it away. Excellent. Great. Well, first of all, thank you, Brett, for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for, for uh, putting this all together in the Green Home Institute. It's a great opportunity, I think, for everybody to learn more and to be more connected to our environment. Um, and I'm excited to be here. So hopefully I can share a little bit about uh, how we operate, the approach that we take to providing green energy. Um, and uh, it'll enlighten everybody to a little different perspective, but one that I think makes a whole lot of sense. So I am gonna 
jump right in and share my screen. Um, okay, so our company is Orca Energy, and we are part of Geotility uh, family of companies, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. And I'm entitling this Geothermal Energy as a Utility Service. Um, there's a lot of different names for what we do. Sometimes it's called third party owned. Um, in the solar industry, it's called a power purchase agreement. We thought about calling it thermal purchase agreement, uh, but in essence, we provide geothermal energy as a service. Uh, and you'll understand a little more, more about what that means. First of all, I wanna tell you a little bit about our companies and a little, little bit about our background because it's kind of important about how we approach the business. Um, Orca Energy is the utility part of the geothermal, well, uh, I'm sorry, geotility group of companies. And Orca Energy as a utility company is just like any other utility company. We build, own, operate, maintain infrastructure that supplies a service to our customers. And our customers being any real occupant of a building, which could be a home, it could be an apartment, it could be an office, um, industrial space, grocery store, we do pools. Um, so any user of a heating and cooling service that's provided through our inter infrastructure are our customers. And we maintain all of that infrastructure, supply that service, um, and just charge a monthly fee for, for these services. And, and to me, this is a natural way of looking at geothermal energy. And I'll explain a little more about that in my background, kind of how, how my lens and how I view all of this. Just like other, geo, other uh, utilities, I should say, we have easements and rights and things like that. Um, and we just ha have ongoing ownership and maintenance of the infrastructure. So that's a little bit about Orca. Um, I want to mention a little bit about Geotility because that's the company that Orca was, was born out of. Geotility uh, has been around for 30 years as a geothermal only company. That's all they do. They are, uh, I would say, one of Canada's largest, if not largest, uh, design build company for geothermal systems. And you'll see uh, a few of the ones that we've installed because there's some really fun projects to talk about that Geotility has done and Orca. But about, uh, and, and you can see some of the statistics there uh, underneath Geotility um, and, and some of the accomplishments and things like that. They operate throughout Canada and really throughout the Western states uh, of the US, done projects in, uh, all, all over California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, uh, and doing some stuff in Colorado. And then uh, Orca Energy, as the utility arm, we do projects all over the U.S., including Michigan, including a lot of the Midwest. We just uh, would not be transporting our trucks from Geotility to do that, but Geotility would oversee all of that and do, take on all the construction. So uh, backing up a little bit, about 15 years ago, Jim Leask, who I'll tell a little bit more about in a second, uh, but the, the CEO and founder of Geotility was seeing um, a, the, the primary obstacle to mass adoption of geothermal was the upfront cost. And so he started Orca Energy and a sister company of ours called TerraSource that's out of Canada, does the exact same thing as Orca Energy, it's just our Canadian counterpart. Um, he started these companies about 15 years ago, offering to pay for all of the upfront costs, all of the, the geothermal infrastructure, the, the, the ground loops that go in, that provide the heat exchange, really as a way to get more adoption and a way to grow the uh, construction company Geotility. But what, what he found was it was um, a a proposition that a lot of customers really gravitated towards and it overcame the largest uh, obstacle to that, to, to that mass adoption. And so Orca grew into its own and uh, has been operating now for over 15 years. And we're on 
a very accelerated growth path right now with a lot of projects that we are uh, involved in and pursuing. And so the company is growing very rapidly, rapidly over the last couple of years. Um, now, as a part of Geotility, one of the things that's exciting for me is that we, we have access to all the resources that you would need in order to fulfill, uh, let's say, a new project. We have a full engineering, uh, we conduct feasibility studies, and we go through a very rigorous process. But, um, you know, as you can imagine, the process of First, looking at a project, understanding, you know, what it's going to take to install the geothermal system and then uh, going through the entire engine design and engineering and looking at all the architecture. Uh, it's, it's quite extensive and it takes a, a, a lot of various different types of resources that I'll talk a little bit about when I get into our process. But um, you know, it's, it's good to have all of that in-house and to have uh, immediate access to that. There, we're really, you know, kind of one company, although we are separate uh, in structures, but we've got common ownership. So um, all of the resources that we could possibly need, we have immediate access to, and uh, we're, we're able to oversee the entire process internally and what I would say, you know, self-perform all of the uh, installation and ongoing maintenance and operations of all that infrastructure. I've put up our, our team here because I wanna mention just a couple of things here. First of all, we're privileged to have somebody that's uh, a real uh, icon in the industry and that's Jim Leask. He's the CEO and founder. And what's fun about the story of Orca and Geotility is it's a family uh, started company. Uh, the gym actually uh, was part of the company when his dad started it. And in the 80s, it, uh, originally, uh, Geotility was not called Geotility, of course, but it was uh, a typical HVAC uh, installation and dealership. But uh, in the early 80s, Jim was uh, in Europe and he saw uh, geothermal being installed all throughout Europe and how it was being used and really saw the application and uh, the opportunity in the, U in the U.S. and in North America throughout Canada as well. And so he turned, geotil he turned geotilically to a company that is strictly focused on, on designing, installing geothermal systems and grew that to what it is today. Uh, about 15 years ago, Stuart Yano joined the company as an engineer. He is uh, a geothermal engineer um, uh, and has been his entire career. And he has since grown up through the ranks of Geotility has become the president. And those are both presidents of, of Geotility as well as Orca. I was introduced to uh, to Orca and to Geothermal just about five years ago. I'll spend just a second on my background because that'll give you an understanding of how I look at things. Um, so my background, I, I, I kind of say that I came through to Geothermal through the side door because uh, I'm usually, in, when it comes to Geothermal industry, I'm usually kind of the, the new kid on the block. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, I was introduced to geothermal. And prior to that, I had actually uh, built and operated a telecommunications company. And, and the way that we did that, we, we installed private fiber to the home system, systems by working with uh, developers. So we would work with developers, typically of master plan communities. We would uh, build, own, and operate infrastructure in the ground that supplied a service. In that case, it was internet service and TV service to homes. And we would charge people a fee for doing that. And when I got introduced to Orca, uh, I could clearly understand their business model. And to me, it just made perfect sense that, you know, the geothermal infrastructure that they're installing was a utility service. So now we, we install infrastructure underground, we connect that into the home and we charge a fee for doing so. Um, when I was introduced to Orca, I was actually with a developer. We were building 
various different uh, sustainable infrastructure components uh, as a business. And uh, honestly, a lot like, like a lot of you, as we saw in the poll, I didn't know a lot about geothermal. In fact, I didn't know uh, much at all. And uh, when I got introduced to it and how it works, I was really uh, astounded. And I almost felt kind of foolish that I didn't know more about it. And I thought, geez, how did I miss this? I can't believe it. And, uh, you know, why isn't there more of this taking place? And I always, at first, was looking for, you know, what am I missing here? And what I found was I'm not the only one that doesn't really understand it or hadn't really heard much about it. There is a, uh, I call it a, there's an issue with the industry, with our industry, and I call, call it the best kept secret in uh, sustainability. Uh, we're just not that well known. So I got so excited about it that actually about two years ago, I joined the Orca team and became part owner in the company. Uh, and now we're on this uh, exciting path. So let's talk a little bit about what geothermal energy is. And it's super simple. Um, basically, what we do is we use the the natural uh, um, temperature of the earth, which maintains a constant temperature. Once you go down about 10 feet or below, uh, the earth will maintain a constant temperature. We're just moving that, that, that energy, that, that, that heat from the earth into a building to provide heating services. And then in the, the uh, warmer months, we move that heat back into the earth to cool the buildings down. And so, so you build a heat exchange system that transfers that heat back and forth. Um, and that's the infrastructure that we talk about. And that's a, a piping system. And I'll show you a diagram of that uh, uh, next. And then, then there's a piece of equipment. Um, there's different ways to, to do this in commercial environments, but it's you know typically just a ground source heat pump that will extract that heat and generate uh, heat within the building or it will move that heat out of the building and cool the building down. Uh, and this just you know, explains what, what, I, what I just talked about. It's, it's the same piece of equipment, unlike you know, traditional um, air conditioning and furnaces, there's one piece of equipment and it runs it in one mode or the other mode. It actually just reverses itself to provide heating or cooling. And it uses the earth to store that, that heat in. So there's really three components. It's first of all, the ground heat exchange system, which is the infrastructure that, that Orca installs and, and, uh, and maintains. And that's really the big expense up front when you're comparing to tr traditional systems. And I'll show you kind of how that cost comparison uh, looks, but that, that's usually the big upfront cost. Um, and then the internal equipment uh, just replaces whatever would be your traditional furnace or your air conditioning system. There is no outdoor condenser because we don't require that. We're rejecting the heat into the ground and not into the air like a condenser would, would do in, in an air conditioning system. And then in a commercial environment, there's no need for, for chillers, uh, for cooling towers, and even for, for boilers. The and, then, and then the third component is the, the distribution system. And that's just the same as what you would traditionally use, whether that's a ducting system or radiant flooring or you know, some kind of other, if it's a commercial environment, some kind of other system. The usual forced air and ducting, and that's, that's the same as, a, as, as traditional. So you know, what are some of the characteristics of, of a geothermal system? Well, first of all, we don't use any uh, fossil fuels. So it completely eliminates greenhouse gas. Uh, we do use electricity, so it depends on how that electricity is generated, but uh, there's no uh, emissions from our equipment. Um, the efficiencies is really where you get the bang for the buck. And that's, uh, you know, kind of what our business is dependent on, our business model. But it operates, you know, at three to 500 uh, percent efficiencies compared to you know, traditional systems, which are, are, are always below, you know, 100%. In other words, for each unit of energy that you put into a geothermal system, you get three to five units back in heating or cooling. Um, like I said before, we're, we're really transferring the heat energy in and out of the earth. 
uh, rather than creating it. Um, and uh, it eliminates outdoor equipment. I'll show you some, some fun pictures about that. So, you know, what, what, what is it about geothermal that, uh, you know, provides benefits? Well, first of all, the, uh, one of the biggest benefits I would say is that, that there's no outdoor equipment, there's no noise that gets created by that. It doesn't take up space in your yard. Um, and, uh, and, and inside it's, it's a constant airflow rather than blasting cold air, there's a continuous flow of, the, of, of continuous temperature and it just cre creates a, a much more comfortable environment. Um, of course, I just mentioned that there's no fossil fuels. Um, and with our business model, there are no upfront costs. A lot of times, um, if somebody, if a, you know, a home buyer is considering either putting it into their existing house or buying a house and adding it to that, there, there's a substantial cost. You know, it can cost upwards of twenty thousand dollars just to install all that infrastructure. Um, and then the other thing I would mention is that we, we fix our uh, energy costs to CPI. So there's no risk of increased uh, energy costs. We all suspect or we all know that natural gas costs will rise as will a lot of other energies and ours is actually constant. Um, and all the equipment's indoors too. And, and I'll show you some uh, statistics on replacement, but that they typically last 25 years. Um, I found this last night and I just had to, to, uh, to add this because I was poking around on the internet and I found uh, a, a forum and, uh, and how you, some of you may be familiar with, with this, uh, this website and kind of what they do. They promote various different products and things like that. But uh, I, I love this. So there's somebody that asked a question. He said, hello, I'd love some suggestions as to what I can do to help hide and decrease the noise from my AC unit. It's two feet from my covered back porch. We love to eat on the porch and it's an extended living area for us. But when the AC is running, it's annoying. And although not really noisy, it's more difficult to hear and carry on a conversation. I love this. We eliminate it. Here's an easy way to get rid of it. And I always say a picture tells a thousand words. And so uh, I put these together because these are all side yards, right? And you've got one way to use your side yard or a different way to, that, that will require a bunch of equipment that make noise and aren't really, really that good looking. I like uh, just kind of studying this and go, okay, which one do I like? I wish those were one of my houses. It's not. Hey, um, Scott, yeah. I wanted to go back to something you mentioned in the utility costs and you use the term uh, CPI. Could you elaborate on what that is exactly? You bet. So uh, it's consumer price index. It is basically inflation. So CPI is an annually published um, index and it's a percentage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in inflationary times, it tries to match inflation, essentially. So uh, if we're in a period of no inflation, then mm -hmm. our prices remain, remain flat. If we're in high inflation and everything else goes up, then our prices will go up commensurately. But we don't have the ability to raise our prices just arbitrarily, randomly, or for other reasons. It's just tied to inflation. And is that tied strictly to energy inflation only? No, CPI is an index that's across the board. Oh, okay. And, and it's a very commonly used for a lot of different industries. Um, the I believe the Treasury Department pu publishes it like in the spring or something like that. And they do an analysis of all, all different, uh, you know, inflations for, for every industry. And they come out with a, a, a single number that's the CPI index for that year. Okay. And then the other question that came up is if you, you know, if you want to, if you can dive a little bit more into the 300 to 500% efficiency math. Yeah, you bet. So um, for each, we'll call it unit of electricity that goes into the geothermal heat pump, the ground source heat pump, which is what uh, uh, 
the it runs off of electric it's just basically a, a pump it's extracting heat from the earth or it's rejecting heat back into the earth for each unit of electricity however you would you know measure that kilowatt hour etc you're going to uh, receive three to five times that energy in heating or in cooling so uh, because we're using the natural thermal properties of the earth, we're simply transferring that, that heat and not creating it. Whereas in let's say a resistance heating system, you're having to use electricity to uh, create that heat internally. So it takes a great deal more to create that. And in an air conditioning system, the same kind of uh, uh, concept applies. So we're able to, uh, to just create much more uh, heating or cooling with that single unit of electricity. Okay. So our, our, our primary market, our primary customer is initially the developer. Of course, we ultimately provide our services to end users, homeowners, apartments, uh, you know, apartment dwellers, commercial offices, things like that. But it all starts with the developer. The developer is the one that makes the decision to, uh, to make their project geothermal. So, you know, a lot of my time is spent working with developers and it's really my background. So it's a natural, you know, conversation for me to have. And what we're able to do is to come in and provide geothermal to the development, to the project at no cost to the developer. Obviously, that's a huge impact. Um, so we remove any of those expenses up front. Um, they then receive to the benefit of having an all geothermal uh, community that eliminates all of the air conditioning equipment and noise and things like that that I told you about. And by the way, I know there's a lot of architects um, in the audience here too. And we work with several architects that that's their sole reason for promoting and for trying to design geothermal into their projects is that they, they're able to recapture that space and able to eliminate that uh, eyesore. And uh, that, that is, you know, with the high density of projects now that are being designed, that's a very big factor. Um, and so, you know, and, and another thing that I'll mention is a lot of developers are under pressure now that's being put on them from the municipalities that they're building in to eliminate um, uh, carbon. These municipalities have got some mandates and geothermal is a huge way to do that. We've actually got one large developer in California that uh, the way that they got approved for their project was because they were, they, they, uh, uh, agreed to make it uh, carbon free. And the only way for them to do that is with, with geothermal. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing for a developer is that, uh, you know, having a partner like uh, Geotility or somebody, you know, like us, give, gives them an expert, somebody that, that really understands and they can, can kind of put that aside and, and not have to be concerned about it. Um, we do also commercial uh, size buildings like apartments and condos um, in a lot of uh, high density areas, even cities. And uh, roof decks are a popular item. And I, you know, captured a couple of uh, interesting, fun photographs. Again, a picture tells a thousand words. Um, I know what I would rather have on my rooftop. And this, again, for a developer, it just cr creates more uh, living space and other amenity for the building that they're trying to sell or rent. Um, so it's, it's a pretty big benefit for them too. And then when it comes to developers, um, this is a brochure that uh, we co-developed with Enritech, who uh, Scott's on the phone here with us representing. Uh, we work together uh, quite a bit with them and uh, we help developers promote uh, within their projects. And here's just a couple of examples of that. We work closely with the developer and we'll, we'll you know, brand this underneath their project and give them all of the, 
all of the, the benefits and help them to educate and promote this to, to their buyers. Now, when it comes to construction, um, there's actually quite a big, big difference and quite a, a, a number of things that we eliminate when it comes to uh, comparing it to a traditional system. If you think about it, you know, we are not requiring any gas uh, for a furnace. If you're typically you know, throughout the US, you're talking about either natural gas or propane. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the, uh, uh, the venting of the gas, the gas lines, we eliminate all that. We of course eliminate all the outdoor equipment um, so, you know, none of the electrical, uh, elect, electrical requirements uh, are, are uh, eliminated. The outside condenser, the pad, uh, everything that goes uh, uh, out, outside is, is eliminated, including the refrigerant that needs to run out there as well. Um, indoors, there's just a single piece of equipment, uh, and that is the ground source heat pump. And then if you're going to provide domestic hot water, which um, the geothermal systems are uh, capable of, then you know, there's a piece called a, a D superheater. I've got some pictures I can show of this too, by the way. Um, it's, there's the process that we go through uh, it is, is pre pretty basic. We uh, essentially just drill holes. We then uh, install our ground loop system, most of the stuff that we do is vertical. Um, and then we connect that to the house. And then in, inside the house, there's something called a flow center that then gets connected to the, the heat pump itself. And I'll give you a couple of pictures of that. So here's a drill rig that goes on the back of a truck. There's all different types of drill rigs. This is one, one of the ones that Geotility uses. And then uh, to the right there, these are the, the laterals um, that go to the home, um, we call them headers. And then you'll see the, the, the two, two valve system that comes in and out where the water flows in and out and the heat pump on the very bottom right there. All right, I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about some of the fun things that we've done as a company, Geotility and uh, Orca. Um, this one here is the Microsoft campus um, and Microsoft made a commitment to go carbon negative. Their objective and their goal is to actually erase all the carbon that, that they've emitted as a comp company since inception. And so they are rebuilding a hundred acre campus, their main, main headquarter campus in Redmond. And they've uh, now installed 900 boreholes, or I should say we have uh, uh, about 500 feet deep. And it's a, a full blown district energy system with an energy center on campus. Uh, I've got a little video here that's kind of fun to show. This will show you kind of what, uh, what's being built there. A quick. Uh, and here's the campus when it's completed. That's a, a rendering. Uh, we we finished all the boreholes now, and now they're they're constructing everything. This is a um, a, a district energy system that that we built in um, Richmond, British Columbia, and it's a municipally owned uh, district system. Richmond. Uh, decided that they wanted uh, as much of the city as possible to be on geothermal. And so they are installing in phases uh, geothermal systems throughout the, the, the sections of the city. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest uh, geothermal energy systems in Canada. Uh, we're proud to be a part of that, this one as well. Uh, this is... Yeah. Oh, go ahead and finish the case studies. And then there was a question specific to them. So, <laughs> okay. You bet. Um, I, I'll, why don't I finish this one? We'll take the question. This is a, a new development. It's uh, currently under construction. I saw a video of this uh, just a couple of days ago and it's mind boggling. I think there were like 12, it was a kind of a panoramic shot and there are about 12 cranes in the air right now. And there's, uh, this is a very kind of a large scale project as you can see 
from the rendering, 13 uh, different towers, I think two hotels, four and a half million square feet, and it will all be uh, using geothermal as well. You wanna interject there? Yeah, so, you know, just looking at um, ownership, and and that and you know who's responsible for and especially on the financing side and i think that there are two kind of questions one is like ownership on these big projects where you've got maybe multiple buildings with different entities owning the building so that's one but then just this maybe a smaller apartment kind of complex where there's individual apartments you know who's paying what how is that working out i mean can you speak to to sort of the ownership and who's paying yeah. the bill kind of model and what you're seeing out there Absolutely, you bet. Um, it's super simple. Um, the we try to uh, really mirror a traditional utility. So, if you think about the gas company, for instance, um, we we do all of the outdoor infrastructure and supply the service into the building. Our point of demarcation is usually at the building. Uh, and once it enters the building, all the indoor equipment, all the indoor plumbing, et cetera, is the builder or building owner. And so we charge a monthly fee for the energy that they're using from our infrastructure. Um, that's uh, typically a flat monthly fee. And um, any of the maintenance of the internal equipment um, just like your furnace or your air conditioning system in a home, uh, you, you would be responsible for. Now, in some commercial cases, we do uh, maintain the equipment. We've got other, you know, we're, we're doing some pools and some things like that where we're actually uh, responsible for the ongoing maintenance of that equipment and things like that. Is that so, so yeah. single family is something... Uh, single family homes can take advantage of this. And, and you're saying uh, they're responsible though for additional maintenance and services, right? Correct. Just like your typical air conditioner or furnace, you know, you'd be replacing okay. the filters and doing your ongoing servicing and things like that. Now I know like, cause you mentioned trying to, in, it's, you know, the idea is like a utility. I know like my utility will send me like a, 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 a and, and I don't sign up for it, but you know, like, a warranty, right? Like, hey, we'll warranty your system. You sign up, it breaks down, we'll help it. Have you done anything like that or looked at that on the maintenance side or just? Yeah, account? actually, you know what? Um, in Canada, it's a very popular thing to have your hot water heater owned and, and maintained by the <laughs> gas company, interestingly. And parts of Europe, that's very popular as well. In the US, not so much, but we do have a builder that wants to offer that to their home buyers, which would include, you know, everything, all of the internal hot water heater and all of the heating and cooling equipment. And right. that would be just a, like a warranty, but it would be, you know, we just do it as a service. And if it needs to be replaced or fixed or whatever, we just, you know, warranty that it works. Right. And, so, and is yeah. it probably worth noting that typically like the infrastructure, I mean, that's not, that's something that lasts a long time, right? You're not usually fixing that, right? Right. Um, it 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 does, and there it depends on what type of a of a system we we have. If it's a district energy system, there's you know a little more to it because sure. uh, you've got a lot of pumps and valves and things like that. If it's a single family home, then yes, that infrastructure and and it you know it it it's mostly piping which is HTPE piping. And, uh, you know, there's long-term uh, life to, to all of that. And since we were talking about ownership, I saw this just pop up before I hand it to you. And I, and it, and I, and I thought it was a good question because I think of, you know, the sort of the property assessed clean energy program that's been going around on the residential side anyway, very different on commercial. And the concerns that come up during the sale process um, now, obviously maybe in this market, you know, you, you take what you can get. Right. But, you know, just in general, what happens with something like this, when you're trying to sell the building and there's still this um, agreement in place? Uh, well, usually it turns out to be a benefit to the sale, uh, because you've got green energy that comes with the building. 
because you typically you have know, got lower utility fees um, and you also uh, have, have eliminated the operation of the equipment um, that's involved. If it's a commercial building, you're, you've get, got quite a bit of savings. In fact, because of the wa water that's used by chillers and cooling towers, um, you've got extra space for that equipment that is now, now available for tenant use. Um, so it becomes actually a, a benefit to the sale. Yeah. Good. Thanks. You bet. Um, so this project is downtown Los Angeles. Uh, well, it's not right downtown, but it's right near USC and that's the LA Coliseum in the background. And this is George Lucas who had built, who's building a museum, uh, for, to house his private art collection, as well as additional art. Um, he wants to make that, that uh, available to the public. And I had, had a chance to tour this building. It's still under construction. It's way over budget, um, but uh, it is unbelievable. And here's a rendering of, of what it's gonna look like when it's done. And if anybody gets to California, when this is completed, you, you're not gonna wanna miss it. And now what's interesting from a geothermal perspective for us is that we were right, right in the critical path of construction. You can see on the right there at the bottom is our drill, well, the drill, drill, drill rigs are in both of those pictures. And that uh, we're right next to the piles that are being poured. And uh, as soon as we were done, they just poured concrete slab over all of our infrastructure and then tied it all, all together. And here's a, a picture from the top, the LA Coliseum off to the right there, all of our stuff down there uh, the bottom being built. I think that's actually looking out over the parking garage. Um, the Bullet Center was uh, the uh, the greenest building in the world at one time. I'm not sure if that's still true, but it is net zero everything essentially. And so uh, the reason why the roof is so big is because all of their uh, electricity gets generated from PV. They've got all the heating and cooling being done by uh, geothermal that we installed. Um, it's you know kind of one of these uh, well-known uh, buildings. I put this one in here because this is an old hotel that built on uh, a tower behind it. That's the the, the new tower behind. And uh, what the builder wanted us to do in this case was to install our infrastructure under the building as it was being built. So they con they constructed the, the parking garage and then we had we created a, a drill rig. Uh, this is some, something that our engineers created. It's all electric. This is actually eight stories down from the bottom of the parking garage. And that's where, where we're drilling our holes and installing our geothermal loops. Um, and this is uh, another example of some uh, other ways to install uh, geothermal loops. If you're installing piles to a certain depth, then you can just, we just strap the loops to the, uh, the rebar for the piles. And uh, as they got installed, our geothermal system uh, went along with it. And we just get a whole bunch of projects. Now these are more um, single family projects that Orca or TerraSource uh, own and operate. Wilden is uh, a uh, community, a master plan community uh, in Kelowna that's close to our headquarters. I believe that now we're up to 700 homes. This has been going on for years now and we'll, we'll continue. And each home that gets built gets a, an uh, Orca geothermal system with it. It's actually TerraSource, our sister company, same thing. Uh, Wembley is another builder that we work with. These are more high density uh, uh, homes, they're townhomes. We've got individual boreholes underneath each uh, garage or driveway. Uh, these are single family homes, you know, small to medium size houses, I would say. Um, and again, single uh, systems for each one. This is a project in uh, Maryland that uh, we did. I would say that's medium density, uh, uh, single family homes. This is a school that's got an individual uh, ground source heat pump for each classroom. It's kind of an outdoor type of a school with little, little classrooms all around. 
Um, and this is a project that's fairly well known in the geothermal world. Uh, it's uh, uh, outside of Atlanta. Uh, it's got, got a lot of agriculture, uh, farm to table, as well as a uh, real uh, uh, lively community that's all on geothermal. And we uh, got uh, orca systems within the town home sections of it. And this is just a kind of a, a list of them. So we go through a fairly rigorous process from, from start to finish before we're re ready to actually start um, our construction because ultimately we, we, we will be owning the system. And so there's quite a bit to understand when it comes to installing, designing, installing geothermal systems, understanding how much infrastructure is going to be required, how much energy you're going to need to, to pull from the earth in order to su supply heating or cooling to the house. So um, this is just a little uh, diagram of, of our 10 step process. Each one of these has got multiple um, you know, requirements and steps in between. But, uh, you know, we go through quite a bit when we're working with, uh, with a new project. Um, that's it for the presentation. And what I wanted to do is, I was talking to Brett earlier, and I wanted to show you a comparison that we did, because I think this will actually help. A developer out of North Carolina, and uh, top here, this is a, uh, they wanted us to compare what they traditionally would install in a 2,500 square foot house in a project in North Carolina. And so we use the equipment that they, that they use. This developer actually installs or builds 5,000 homes, over 5,000 homes a year. And so, you know, the pricing, we use their pricing. So you'll see some pricing here that compares uh, you know, what we would, would supply for a geothermal system compared to what they're, they're doing today. So what you have here on the left is what we would have installed for a three, this is a three ton system. It's a house that requires three tons of, of cooling. Um, and, uh, and that's a specific actually Enrotech system. Um, and that's what they use and they told us to compare it to. You can see the performance differences are quite, uh, quite different. And so we took this through an entire 25-year uh, life cycle starting from construction. So one of my slides showed a little bit of this and you can see the, all the construction requirements for a ground source heat pump on the left compared to all of the construction requirements uh, on the right for a regular gas furnace and air conditioning system. Um, you can just tell that there's quite a bit more. Now, when it comes to the actual costs, uh, you can see the installation of a ground source heat pump is a little bit more upfront, but there are rebates attached to that. Um, and, and by the way, I heard you mention, uh, Brett, that something about the tax rebates that are still available. Those are set to actually increase to 30% and go for 10 years. Um, that was in the Build Back Better bill, but now it's being created as its own separate bill. And it's expected to be passed um, some, sometime before the uh, August congressional break. Is that your traditional tax extenders where they always kind of just slam in all the tax credits all together and everybody's happy and not happy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's actually something that's more of a longer term solution. Oh, um, okay. And, uh, and geothermal is now being tied to solar. And so solar and geothermal will be treated equally. Right. Uh, um, and it'll be a 10 year, 30%. You know, it's been this thing that's been going on every 18 months, two years, they just kind of kick the can down the road. Now it's going to be a 10 year, 30%, you know, assured uh, tax credit. And it's going to be also um, uh, direct pay. So for those that don't have a uh, tax requirement, they can actually get it in a, in a form of, it, of, of cash. Yeah. So that's the one where they actually, like, I know one of the biggest pushbacks to the solar is you know 
you, you, you can, you know, you, it's a tax rebate. So you have to have a liability, right. And, and not right. many people don't have liabilities, right. Right. Unless they're running a business or something. So you're saying this is more of an, it comes on the upfront to cut the cost or after you purchase it, maybe. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And you really feel that, uh, like, I mean, you can't say anything for sure, but it seems, it seems confident to you. I, I just yeah, haven't heard it's, anything. It's so. got bipartisan support. We have, and our industry group is very active uh, okay. um, it, in, in legislation. And so uh, we have, uh, we're, we're confident it will be passed. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of getting everybody together and, you know, getting their focus on it and get, uh, getting that bill passed, which we're, we're being told it'll be before the August recession or August yeah. recess. <laughs> well, everybody call your representative, I guess, if you're. Yeah, exactly. You're right. So, um, well, yeah, anyway, I, I just, thanks for, for reminding everyone of that. So, yeah. absolutely. Um, okay. So this is a total cost of ownership. Here's the installation cost. There's a replacement now over time. Again, this is a, meant to be a 25 year comparison, uh, because the uh, geothermal equipment is all inside, it ha has a longer life. Um, but you know, you see the replacement costs are fairly similar, and then you've got your annual operating and servicing. So uh, these are just some of the servicing requirements comparison. And then what we did is we used the actual utility rates for this area. And the you know, directly from the, the Duke, Duke Power, who was the energy company there, as well as um, I think it was Piedmont, yeah, Piedmont Natural Gas, and uh, uh, using what we, we we knew to be the uh, the heating and cooling requirements, and just how much gas and how much uh, uh, electricity would be required for each of the systems, and you can see how those compare. Uh, fairly fairly close. And then we put that all together over a 25 year period uh, and come up with a total cost and then even broke that down to a monthly amount. And so when you take a look at th this on a monthly basis, pretty close. Um, and, you know, we're actually, um, you know, very pleased with this because we knew what a discount they were uh, getting on their traditional equipment. And frankly, it wasn't, uh, you know, very uh, high quality uh, equipment. These were very entry level homes. So I just thought I would uh, share that with you. Um, Brett, I don't know if you want me to show some of our construction diagrams that I kind of uh, showed you before or, you want to open it up to Q and A? It's yeah. Let's. Uh, um, there are some questions coming in that we have not got to, and I know we're kind of coming up on our time, but uh, we're gonna. For those of you who want to keep hanging out and answering questions, you can uh, stick around for a little bit. Or yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. So um, before um, I get to those questions, just. Um, Real quick here, I wanted to remind everyone who is joining us and then also has to get going that, um, you know, first, as always, yes, the answer is always yes. This session is being recorded and will be posted online on our YouTube channel. So you can rewatch it, share it, um, give it to a friend, give it to a colleague, uh, subscribe, and you'll know when it comes out uh, right away. For those of you watching this in the future, not right now, on demand, head over to our Thinkific channel, USGBC channel, whatever channel it might be on. Take your quiz with an 80% passing rate and you can get your certificate. Um, for those of you watching live, again, remember to mark certs at gutenbergcerts.com as safe. Check your spam, you'll be getting your certificate there for attending. And before we uh, again head into all those questions, I just have to say a big thanks to um, all of our uh, volunteer speakers this year, uh, all of our board of directors, our executive director, Jose Reña, and all of our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi, Electric, April Air, um, Build Equinox, um, everyone who's helping support, uh, allowing us to do what we do 
and keep these uh, sessions going. So yeah, there were some questions um, just with the with the financing part. Um, are there any uh, uh, additional fees that are up front, or is this truly really, you know, at least from the infrastructure, the exterior infrastructure, the drilling and all that, is this really uh, truly all 100% financed, or is there some kind of gray area there? No, I, I wouldn't say there's a gray area. It's all we we cover the entire cost of that infrastructure. Uh, like any other utility, right? We are recovering our costs over a long period of time. To to the to the extent that that there's a tax credit, we we do charge a connection fee, and that can vary, and that will impact the monthly fees as well. So we work with the developer to come up with a structure that gives the home, and the homeowner is usually the, the, the ben, ben, beneficiary of that tax credit. So we may end up, uh, it may be a $3,000 tax credit and we end up um, charging a $1,500 connection fee and the homeowner gets a $1,500 tax credit on top of you know, the, the credit that they get for any other renewable energy. Uh, quick. So, so you're saying when a tax credit credit is available, you charge an additional fee? Is that what you're saying? Correct. You have okay. Um, and now, obviously, we just discussed this. You know, the current situation of the tax credits are high uncertainty, right? Um, and they could take a long time, from what I can tell, to get versus what I think it'll be fixed, right? So, when that's the case, do you just do you have to wait then until they get it, or? Uh, yeah, so the timing of that uh, can vary. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. And that's part of the process that we go through with the developer to work out, you know, how that's going to be best administered. Yeah. Now, what about, you know, you know, obviously, construction costs are increasing and, you know, people uh, obviously struggling to fun projects and always looking for ways to reduce costs, you know, clearly, you know, you showed at least comparing it to sort of the bare bones system at the end of the day, the bare bones system, you know, wins out, right? I mean, you, you, you know, you, you showed it that over time it doesn't, but in the, you know, day one, it wins, right? Because it's, you know, it just was ultimately cheaper and that, and, you know, where, where used to be $2,000 might be, Hey, that's okay. Now it's like, it's every penny. Right. And that's what we're hearing. So given that, has there been any thought to help fund the, you know, additional costs of the interior systems themselves, or has that been a, a conversation? Yeah. Um, every situation is different and, um, there are, are ways to help. I'll say subsidize that. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but you know, in the end, we 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 have a very sophisticated financial modeling that we have to do as a business, and um, you know we can it, tweak those numbers. There's a lot of levers in that model, and uh, you know we kind of come up with various different scenarios that are going to be most beneficial for the homeowner, for the developer. You know, of course, we need to meet our metrics. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in the way that we structure things, uh, from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, just going back again, reminding us on the utility approach, you know, uh, when it comes to single apartments, uh, a lot of times the utilities, especially now we get into sub metering, right? So we can get the usage from every single, um, apartment. Um, is that something that I can just remind us again, the question kind of came up after you talked about it, just to remind us again, is that possible with that or, you know, it um, it's, it's a, what's interesting about geothermal is that it's a fairly consistent use of energy. Uh, we do not monitor apartments. We don't meter them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it really wouldn't make that much difference, even if we did. Um, and so it's just a flat fee. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and, you know, there's just some questions here, like what you're seeing out there as far as, 
Um, you know, obviously we talk, we're talking here about financial restrictions, but there's also zoning and ordinance restrictions. And I'll, you know, an undisclosed unnamed city, you know, I've heard <laughs> from one of their residents several times that, you know, it was just very difficult for them to, um, you know, they really wanted geo and it just was impossible because of, you know, uh, where their driveway was located and how close things were located to other homes and roads. And um, so what are you seeing with that? And, you know, are there any opportunities to overcome that? Is it technology, legislative, or, or what are you seeing? Yeah, um, good, really good question. And uh, it really varies, you know, state to state, mm -hmm. even city to city, right? Um, California at one time was really difficult to drill because mm -hmm. every Everything was uh, uh, you know, underneath the whole water drilling um, uh, requirements and regulations. That's kind of loosened up now and is changing. Uh, other states have various different other requirements. In Florida, for example, you can't dr drill past a certain point. I think it's 100 feet or something like that hmm. without some real extensive studies and permitting and things. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that can be a challenge. Um, our, our typical model is to, to do a, a greenfield project. And so we're typically, you know, part of a large project that has gone through an extensive amount of environmental analysis and soils engineer and phase one reports and things along those lines. So I think that, you know, compared to, let's say, a homeowner that lives in a city that's got, you know, a lot of uh, legacy infrastructure installed, et cetera, um, it might be a little easier for the way we approach it. But, you know, having said that, uh, we it's not without our challenges sometimes, for sure. Um. Talk to me a little bit about um, existing housing and both in, um, you know, what you're seeing or what you're doing from the infrastructure challenges, which is kind of what you were just saying, but, um, you know, also from the financing, you know, so financing. And then there was one specific question to like, you know, reusing or using the spaces natural gas lines used to be in, you know, are you seeing anything like that? Yeah. So, you know, it, uh, I just came from New York Geo, and I, I would say, you know, New York Geo is probably the, as far as a state um, geothermal uh, association is, is really very, very active and at, uh, a very good barometer of, of thing, things that are going on uh, in, in various locations. And then what's happening in New England and, and throughout New York is the gas companies are looking at ways that they can become part of the geothermal industries. And one of those ways it is to use their existing gas lines or even, even install you know, new infrastructure. But uh, that is something that's being explored in a number of different areas that I'm, I'm hearing about for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I'll see and if there was any other specific questions, but, um, you know, I think we, uh, I think you answered, uh, all of them and I'll, and I'll send all the ones that we had on to you if you see more opportunity to reach out to anybody, but, uh, you know, again, I, I guess just before we wrap up, um, where can people go to learn more or contact you if they want to reach out? Yeah, you bet. You know, our website is orcaenergy.com. There's quite, quite a bit of information on there. Um, and my contact information is right there. Love to hear from anybody. Um, you know, we, uh, we're active in the industry. We, I love what I do and I love this, this industry. It's fun to see it really exploding. Yeah. Great, Scott. Well, I appreciate you and I appreciate Orchid Energy having you come out. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of the week. We'll catch you next week. Next week. Take care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.